Uh, so in this lecture, I want to start going through the um, stereochemistry that we can expect when we do a Diels-Alder reaction. So um, there's a general uh, sort of stereochemical model where um, what, uh, where, where, what I could do is I could add groups to each of the positions that could result in stereo centers. And I'm gonna just have generic groups like A, B, C, D. Um, and then on the dienophile, we can have E, F, G, H. Okay, so when we do a, this is like the maximum possible number of stereoisomers. What we get then, if we do a Diels-Alder reaction, and we can have curly arrows, I don't want to make this picture too cluttered. So we could have a situation like this. And I think that, that first arrow is a little, I'm going to be consistent. That's okay. It's okay to like attack the atom, I suppose, but I want to be a little bit more consistent and show the bond kind of going between the two atoms being formed. Um, just my style. You can have it attack the atom, I guess. But anyway, okay. So the stereochemical outcome I want to show is, um, well, if we have this sort of arrangement of groups, it turns out that A is going to be a dash, B is going to be a wedge. And if that's the case, then C is a wedge, D is a dash. And then, um, F is a dash, E is a wedge, G is a wedge, and H is a dash in this case. Okay, so this should not have made, uh, in terms of like intuition and seeing how this all fits together, this should not make a lot of sense right now. What I'm just showing you is that um, if we had maximum substitution, here is the outcome. And what we're going to work on the next few lectures is developing this model so that we can understand um, where all of this comes from and be able to predict it in um, other models. So just to, and I'm going to highlight this, this is like something we could keep in our back pocket, our notes, because it may get to a, we may get to a position where it's just easier to position the diene and the dienophile like I've shown, and then um, draw the resulting uh, products. Now, the thing I want to emphasize is we also have the enantiomer being formed. The enantiomer is formed. And what the enantiomer is, and perhaps I don't need this line right here, no big deal if you have it, but just for the sake of notes for later. Um, the enantiomer is where we flip everything. Whereas if B started a wedge, it becomes a dash, A becomes a wedge, D becomes a wedge, C becomes a dash, and then we have um, F and G flip, everything flips. Ah, shoot, okay. Everything flips. Okay, so everything is flipped. Now, um, I really just draw one. I draw one, and the one that I typically draw is this first one, and we'll see why. It's, and it's just my style of how I develop my stereochemical model. It could be that you, um, you like the dyne file coming in from the top instead of the bottom, which is my typical style, and in which case you would favor the, al the alternative. But for, for unless we have something really special going on, the, the Diels-Alder reaction is going to form both in the antiomers equally well. And we've emphasized that, and now I'm just drawing the structures. So what I want to recall is that, recall that um, substitution, getting ahead of myself, sorry. Substitution on the internal carbons of the diene does not result in stereocenters.
Okay. So what I'm referring to here, and let's pick on like chlorine, for example. So if we put chlorine atoms here, these are the internal carbons of the diene. We do a Diels-Alder reaction with ethene. The remaining pi bond actually renders the two carbons that I've labeled with dots as not being stereocenters. So that's, that's how I want to start. But now let's start to piece together the stereochemical model that I showed up above. Let's consider um, the uh, uh, substitution at the other ends um, or at the, the ends of the, the termini of the diene. So what if instead we had the chlorines out here, in which case, we would have stereocenters at either one of these positions. Now, it turns out this, this molecule is, um, has a plane of symmetry through it, so it's actually meso. Well, let's not worry about that detail. That just means that I don't write plus enantiomer for this one because both being wedges and both being dashes are identical. So um, I, don't, I, I could just write one. Now, according to the stereochemical model, According to the stereochemical model, those chlorine atoms are going to be dashes. I believe these were A and D. So it was A and was D in the stereochemical model, which I'll highlight again in green, the stereochemical model. Let's see if I can bring that out a little bit just so you can see it. Oh, A and C, excuse me. So that was A and C in the general stereochemical model where we had A, oh no, it was D, shoot, shoot, shoot. All right, that's all right. Easy to undo that. Okay, so um, it was A and D in the general, no, no, it wasn't. It, gosh, I'm sorry. I see what I did. I highlighted A and D from the enantiomeric stereochemical model. Okay. Now it's, we're on the same page. So hopefully you can see these are A and D in the general stereochemical model as I like to show it with both being dashes. Now the enantiomeric model would have put them as wedges to each other. Um, and that's okay because um, both enantiomers are formed equally well. And actually in this case, there's a plane of symmetry slicing through this. So we don't, the, the both wedges and both dashes are the same. We don't need to write plus enantiomer. Don't worry about meso. If, if me, don't, don't let meso stress you out. Just recognize that the CLs map, map on to A and D of our stereochemical model. Now, again, the stereochemical model is nice um, and it's accurate, but I wanna ask the question, why are the CL atoms cis? I could ask why are they wedges, both wedges or both dashes, depending on which enantiomer we consider. But a more general question would be why are they both cis? That is, why are they both on the same side of the ring? Well, what I want to do is I want to go back and consider how um, the diene and the dienophile approach. Okay. If I do this, well, let's let's draw the pieces first before I get into the CLs. So I've got my diene shown as that perspective drawing and the dienophile approaching from underneath. And then the ring is going to form across here. And the reason why we have this underneath approach is so that the orbitals can overlap with each other. Now, what I was working on drawing was adding the CL atoms. So the CL atom at the lower carbon actually points out in a way 
the CL on the upper carbon points um, up in a way. Now, the reason why is both of these alkenes are E, and in fact, they're trans to each other, if that, if that is easier to see. Both of them are E, they're not Z alkenes. So I have to maintain that when I draw the perspective drawing. That is my starting structure where they're labeled A and D, those alkenes are also E. So if I gave you E alkenes, when you redraw the diene and the dienophile, you have to maintain the appropriate um, EZ configuration. You have to, if it starts E in the drawing, you have to draw it E in the um, orient of the orientation of the diene uh, when the Diels-Alder reaction actually occurs. Okay, so now we're going to let the Diels-Alder reaction occur. And I'm going to consider my sort of unrelaxed structure where I basically just make all the bonds, but I leave the atoms in the same arrangement that we had them when we allowed the dienophile to approach the diene. Now it's hard to tell that both of the Cl atoms are cis to each other as I have it drawn here. These are in fact both cis to each other. So maybe what I could do is I'm going to go in with blue and I'm going to draw the two H atoms. The two H atoms are going to be pointing in these directions so as to maintain the same E or trans character of the diene. So those H's are kind of crowding over each other in the forming ring. They're they're bonding like um, kind of arranged in such a way that they're leaning over the ring system. Now what happens when we relax, and this is where students tend to um, struggle just a hair, is when we relax, we're going to unfold the ring to get back to a flat six membered ring with the two chlorine atoms. So this is kind of a relax and unfold. Okay, so the two hydrogens in my in my hands right here, the two hydrogens are my thumbs and they're pointing over the ring and the two chlorine atoms are pointing out. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to relax the ring so that it can get back to something that we could depict flat. Yeah, there's a little bit of chairness to it, but it's got a double bond. Who cares about that right now? I wanna draw it flat. When I do that, what I, what I have to do is kind of unfold the ring where I'm going to kind of tilt the, I'm going to pick up the corners of the atoms, um, which uh, let me let me define the corners. Picture this. I'm going to take these things that I've highlighted in green, and I'm just going to pull them open to get back to a flat six member ring. Pull them open. Now, if I pull them open, my thumbs are going to spin outwards and both be up. The things that were hanging over the ring are both up now. The chlorine atoms will spin downward. So the chlorine atoms spin downward and the hydrogens spin up. And now what that means, I'm gonna do this in blue. That means is that the hydrogens are shown as both being wedges and the chlorine atoms are both dashes when we unfold our new cyclohexene. And so this is for the dienophile approaching from the bottom. Okay, we unfold the chlorine atoms, both spin down and they're cis to each other. Okay, so it's that relaxing exercise that we have to do each time, but it's that relaxing that allows us to see why we get the why the stereochemical model, the general stereochemical model that I alluded to before works. Okay, let's start to move groups around to um, other positions. Now what I'm basically getting at in all of this is that if we have substituents added, we're going to have the two things that are um, on the sort of Z configuration which I'll highlight in uh, green here, these two things are going to be up. Sort of they're the Z component. Whereas if they were number one priority, we'd have a Z alkene here. Now the things that are 
E are going to then be pointed down if the dienophile approaches the bottom. This is opposite if the dienophile approaches from the top. So if the dienophile comes underneath, we have this approach. And this is kind of, I'm going to put my initials. This is my general approach to, to teaching this. And, and I'm just more comfortable with it. But if you want the dienophile coming um, on top, then we flip everything. So this becomes up, this becomes down, down, and up. And this is just the enantiomer. And I'm just personally um, not, uh, not good at drawing that model on more complicated cases. I just have more practice drawing the dynophile coming underneath. But I'm just going to emphasize again, both occur. Now, what we recognize is that for the pieces that I've highlighted in red, um, they're going to be cis or on the same side in either case. Now, same thing with the things I've highlighted in green. So whether the dynophile comes in underneath or on top, we're going to see the formation of um, um, a product where both of those groups are cis to each other in either case. Let's consider another example. So, and we're going to just use this piece of our stereochemical model again. Let's consider a model where we've got um, a methyl group, a chlorine atom, a methyl group, and a chlorine atom. Now, if we had to characterize this as E or Z, we would put a one next to the chlorine in either case. So we have an E on the bottom and a Z on the top alkene. And let's go ahead and keep it simple in terms of the diels alder reaction that we do, where we've got our diels alder reaction happening with ethene. And that'll give rise to a product that has a methyl group and a chlorine atom in either case. Now, what we want to do is define the stereochemistry. And in particular, define the major diastereomer that's formed. Now, according to our stereochemical model, we like to, um, our approach is to put the diene um, underneath, or excuse me, the dienophile underneath. So I'm going to redraw my diene in a perspective format, and then I'm going to have my dienophile. Now what I have to do is attach the groups. So I have chlorines and methyl groups to consider. This one looks a little haphazard. We still want that to be trigonal planar. We're just drawing it at a perspective. Now, the top alkene was Z and the bottom alkene was E, where chlorine was number one. That means I have to put the chlorine on the inside and the CH3 pointing out and away, whereas down below, chlorine is on the outside and the CH3 is pointing in. Now, when those um, two systems approach each other and do a Diels-Alder reaction. We're going to form bonds such that if we keep this perspective, nothing else sort of moves. Now the chlorine and the CH3, um, there's a CH3 on top that's pointing out and away. There's a chlorine that's pointing in. And then um, on the lower carbon, that's a stereo center, which I could label these in um, green. Sure, that seems to be the format. The two green carbons, they kind of um, differ in the groups that are over the formed ring um, and pointing outwards. So when we unfold and relax this, I need to take the two green carbons and pull them outwards. That means the things that are pointing over the ring spin and are up to each other. So here are my two carbon atoms being mapped. Now the, there's a chlorine atom on the top that's moving up. So that gets a wedge. 
And then there's a CH3 on the other carbon that's spinning out and up. So that gets a wedge. And then the other groups are spinning down. So we have a CH3 and a chlorine. So here, these are the things pointing out and they spin down as we pick up the green um, atoms and spread them out so that they can relax into a proper six membered ring geometry. Now recall, now if you look at this structure it does not have a plane of symmetry through the molecules. So we have to write plus enantiomer or enantiomer plus. And that's covering our bases so that we don't have to draw the result where the alkene, the dienophile comes in from the top. That would just flip everything. Okay, but we don't have to draw that since we wrote plus enantiomer. Okay, now um, what's uh, interesting about this is uh, we could have some pretty cool um, um, dienes that actually bridge the two ends of our diene unit. So cyclopentadiene is a nice example. Cyclopentadiene as an interesting diene substrate. Okay. Now cyclopentadiene is this structure. There's cyclopentadiene and if you look, it does have a diene core to it. And so what we could do is we could consider it serving as a diene in a Diels-Alder reaction. Now, what does that look like? Well, let's first of all, redraw our diene. So it looks like a diene that we typically use. And now we have our diene unit and we could draw some arrows where we go here to here to here, giving us our new bonds and our new pi bond. So here are the carbon atoms from the diene. Whoops, let's, let's just make that. Um, let's go here and here. This is our new bond. Now, what about the CH2 that I've kind of highlighted with a dot? Well, that's actually going to be connecting the two diene carbons together. So if I put stars on the diene carbons, we need to connect those together with a CH2 group. Well, that's just like a five membered ring embedded in a six membered ring. Sorry if this is overly highlighted. So what we say is this is a um, bridging CH2. So the product of a Diels-Alder reaction with cyclopentadiene is a bridging or has um, has a bridging CH2. It's bridging across the molecule, connecting the two starred carbon atoms together. There's our two starred carbons. We do a Diels-Alder reaction. We'll keep this one less colorful. Okay, so there is our bridging CH2. Maybe I'll just add one color, bridging CH2. It's just connecting the two atoms that were starred with each other. Now, what's the bridging CH2 stereochemistry? Well, it turns out that according to our model, it is cis. Let's look at that more specifically. So, if we 
have our diene and our dienophile approaching each other, how do we draw the bridging CH2? Well, it's kind of like a substituent that is Z in both cases. We have a Z alkene in both cases. Whoop, that looks exactly like an E. So we have a Z alkene in both cases for our diene alkene geometry. And as we draw the connection point between the stars, we get a product of a typical diels alder reaction now with sort of this bridge between the two carbon atoms that I show as stars of our diels alder um, dying in this case. Now, when we unfold and relax this, we unfold and relax this, we have a six membered ring. Now what I wanna do is take the stars and pull them out, pull them out. Now what that's going to do is that's going to take the, the uh, um, it's kind of hard to picture, but we have our two, C, our two carbon or our CH2 connect, connection point between the two start atoms. And that's just going to flip up. And conversely, in the model that I don't draw, with the dienophile approaching from the top, it would then just flip down. So we get, Wedges. So it turns out that in our general stereochemical model where I put um, up and up, that also applies when we have bridging atoms. We just say up in that case. Okay. So in this lecture, we started to dissect the stereochemistry that results from having substitution at the dyne. What I want to do in the next lecture is look at the dienophile geometry. So that'll do it for this lecture. Now let's pick on the dienophile in the next lecture.